Good evening and welcome to our second in our series, The Theology of Karl Barth, a new application, and it is being delivered by Dr. Sam Dirty. It is indeed a joy to be with you and we welcome you once again to our presentation. Can we bow our heads for a few moments as we invite God's presence into our midst? For our loving and eternal Father who continues to call us forward day by day to assist us as we grow, to assist us as we become more and more conscious of who you are. We give thanks for those who have gone before us, whose words we can still today read, whose thoughts we can wrestle with, but more especially, we give thanks that in our time that we can wrestle with our own thoughts, with our own understandings. We pray that you may cause us not to be enslaved to the past, but that we may look forward holding your hand and allow you to lead us into new places. Be with us, gracious God, especially this night. Be with your servant, Dr. Sam, as he shares with us. And may these words that we share, these thoughts, these ideas that we express, may they assist us in taking us ever further, closer to the true reality of who you are and who we are in you. We ask this now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I invite you once again, Dr. Dirty, to speak with us. Okay, well, good evening, and thank you for joining again with this seminar series. Uh, welcome to all of you who are joining online from a whole host of different places. If you missed the sem uh, seminar last week, then don't worry, I will briefly recap last week to outline the key points, as the theological method that I presented is foundational to this week's topic. So this week, I would like to talk about the death of God. And just to quickly make the point at the very beginning that I intend to talk about the death of the being of God. And I make this point now because um, there is another understanding of the term death of God. I'm sure many of you are aware of the death of God movement that arose mostly in the United States in the 1960s. This was a movement called radical theology, which had the underlying belief that God is meaningless and impossible to reconcile in the modern world. The only way that it was possible to find meaning, meaning according to radical theology, was through, sec, through the secular world. Probably the most famous book from this movement is by Thomas Altizer and William Hamilton. The book was called Radical Theology and the Death of God. I just wanted to clarify this, uh, that this movement isn't what I mean when I speak of the death of God in this seminar. Today, I want to talk to you through the idea of God the Trinitarian God of Christianity, that particular nameable God, I want to talk about that God dying. The argument I will follow says that this is the most controversial, difficult and unsavory part of Christianity. But the argument also says it is the orthodox view. But it goes against everything we know of gods. Gods do not change. They are eternal, unmoving, perfect in their completeness. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Even Paul, when he wrote that in the first letter to the Corinthians, he knew that preaching Christ crucified goes against the prevailing knowledge about everything we know of deity, everything we know of gods, that gods do not even suffer the human condition, let alone die. But Paul preached it. He preached that Jesus was the son of God and he was crucified, died and was buried. And so what I want to explore today is how much do we still preach Christ crucified? How much do we still base our beliefs on the death of Christ? And importantly, how does this belief or lack of belief affect the way that we worship God and perform liturgy? I want to talk about how this debate to whether Christ dies or not and what Christ's position is in the Godhead and how this debate was resolved at the beginning of the life of the church, and how 
that argument, at least to the, to the theologian I will present today, how that argument has re-emerged in the present day, but the result of that argument has gone in the other direction. So the outline of this evening's talk is to briefly recap the key understandings that we took from last week's seminar about the theology of Karl Barth. Then I'm going to uh, briefly introduce you to a sadly no longer contemporary theologian, but one who continued with Barth's theological project. He's called Robert Jensen. I will then trace the history of the debate about whether Jesus died or not, and his role in the Godhead. And then I will talk in some detail about the theological drama of the Easter Tridium. In the final section, I will talk about how this systematic theology relates to the life and ministry of the church, particularly around Easter. And finally, I have something for you all to take home with you at the end of the evening. I know Easter is on the way in the next couple of months, and I know how much preparation is needed for this most important festival of the church. So I have made you all a poster to put up in your church on Holy Saturday. Saturday, the 16th of April 2022, which I hope is Holy Saturday. Church closed. God is dead. There is no hope. Please find alternative arrangements for salvation. This is, of course, slightly tongue in cheek. And it is probably a little above my station to challenge you, but I'm going to. What I would love the church to do at Easter is to take this statement seriously. God is dead. Why? Well, I will do my best to today to argue why this understanding of God is so central to what we believe, so important to our practices, but most importantly and consequentially, important to the being of God. The death of God is not primarily about us as humans. God dying is first and foremost a real issue for God himself. Easter is not just a drama for us as humans, it is a dramatic act in the life of God. And I really do think that if you take Bart's theology seriously, this is the thesis that you would nail to your church door. So last week I spoke about the theology of Karl Barth, who proposed a method of doing theology. His proposal is that we should take God himself as our primary source of theology. And we can do that because God reveals himself to us as God. To quote one of Barth's most famous lines, God reveals himself, he reveals himself through himself. He reveals himself. What Bart is saying here is that in God's happening with his chosen people, in the Old Testament, God happens with Israel. In the New Testament, we see God happening with groups of people around the Jewish nation. The important thing to understand is that God is God happening. And he is happening as himself with us. We can know the true being of God because God reveals himself to us. And as I said last week, the way I find it, the most productive and insightful way to think about God is to think of God as a verb. God is a doing thing. And as God does, he becomes God. God is doing God. But this tautology does not negate the theological task because God is doing God with us in creation. So he is knowable. And as we can continue to re-witness God again and again by passing down the message within the scriptures, God continues to reveal himself. Revelation is still ongoing and present with us today. And when we say this, we are simultaneously saying that God is still with us and present today. Now, what about when God does human, when God does God as a human? The word of God comes amongst us. God reveals himself as Jesus Christ. Let me quote Bart again to clarify the point beyond doubt. Revelation, in fact, does not differ from the person of Jesus Christ, nor from the reconciliation accomplished in him. To say revelation is to say the word became flesh. What Bart is saying here is that Jesus is no less revelation for being a person. Jesus is God revealed. Jesus is God being God. And as we have said, what God does in revelation is what God is. So what Jesus Christ does the reconciliation that is witnessed by the scriptures happens to the being of God. So how do we cope with this in our theology? The cross. If we are saying that what God does in Revelation is God, then what happens to the being of God when Jesus dies? 
As I said last week, Karl Barth's method is theological theology. This is theology based in God's own self-understanding. Bart does not at this point permit us to grab our Aristotle or Plato to work out this problem. If we are to understand the cross, we must turn to scripture. So to answer the question as to whether God dies, we will have to ask Revelation, what is the relationship between Jesus and God? And to do this today, we're going to move to a more contemporary theologian named Robert Jensen, someone who continued Karl Barth's theological project in modern times, and he really tried to apply this theology to the modern day. And it's not that Karl Barth's theology is not good enough to do this, but Barth was not exactly concise with his writing. The church dogmatic covers 6 million words over 12 volumes. Robert Jensen is wonderful for many reasons, but one of those is he is concise. His entire systematic theology covers two fairly short books, both of which I'm very pleased to find are in Codgerton College's library. Over the course of the presentation, we will return to some of Bart's theology, but that is only because Robert Jensen does the same. Robert Jensen takes Bart's theology and uses it as a method. And today, what I'm going to present is very much the result of that. So a very brief biography of Jensen, just so you have some context for him. Robert Jensen was an American Lutheran theologian who died pretty recently in late 2017. He was educated in Luther Seminary in the US before he undertook his doctorate in Basel. And his doctoral dissertation was on the theology of Karl Barth. And he had the great privilege of Karl Barth actually reading and approving as of, it, of his thesis. So we can be fairly sure that Jensen's theology is true to what Barth had to say. And like any theologian worth their salt, Jensen was at one point, and probably still is, considered a heretic. Most of the Luther College Faculty of Religion, and interestingly the Faculty of Bi Biology, resigned their posts because of Jensen's views, leaving Jensen to rebuild the entire faculty. Jensen then spent part of his career at Mansfield College at the University of Oxford, before heading back to the USA to the Lutheran Seminary in Gettysburg, and then he spent some time at St. Olaf's College, and then he finished his career at Princeton Theological Seminary. He is considered as probably the greatest American theologian of all time, and his systematic theology is probably the most important in recent history. So to Jensen, we will pose the question, did God die? But he will do that annoying thing by responding to the question with yet another question. He will ask, is God triune? According to Jensen, an affirmative answer to either question will mean an affirmative answer to the other. A negative answer will be a negative answer for both. According to Jensen, if God doesn't die, then he is not trying. And then it seems we are very quickly moving away from the basic Christ Christian dogma. So what was the problem that Jensen saw with theology? We talked last week how theologians identify problems with theology and then offer solutions to that problem. The problem that Jensen tracks through history is that he believes that humans, even some Christians, don't believe that Jesus is fully God. According to Jensen, we, Christians, theologians, and priests, have great difficulty in accepting that Jesus Christ is fully, completely, nothing other than the second identity of the triune God. And why do we find it difficult to accept this? Because Jesus dies. He is beaten, whipped, nailed to a cross, and left to suffer an agonizing death. And why do these events in Jesus' life prevent us from believing Jesus truly is God? The reason is simple. We, and the we here refers to theologians of past, present, and almost certainly future. We have been infected with Greek philosophy and cannot shake away their conception of deity. The problem that Greek philosophy created is this. Timeless deity was posited to be the ordering foundation of time's otherwise meaninglessly fleeting sequence. It's one of my favorite Jensen quotes, which is taken from his systematic theology. He writes beautifully. But what he's saying here is that to give meaning to the world, to make sense of the suffering, the injustice, the changing nature of the human short-lived experience of existence, the Greeks posited a God behind the scenes, an unchanging eternal God to which we should all strive to reach in order to reach the best possible existence. This deity is perfection, unsullied by the ravages of time. In Mediterranean antiquity, deity is defined by immunity to time, by impassibility. What Jensen spends the majority of his first book of systematic theology doing is showing how the church who inherited this understanding of deity right from its origins 
right through to the present day, have struggled to reconcile an unchanging, perfect and impassable idea of God with their passable, mutable and contingent Jesus of Christianity. The question is therefore not, does God die? But is Jesus God? Is the man who dies God incarnate? To rephrase the question, is the man Jesus part of the Trinity? If the answer is yes, then the question of whether God dies answers itself. Jensen therefore begins his telling of this ongoing theological tension between Greek impassibility with the Christian witness to the life and death of Jesus Christ by starting with the formulation of the Nicene Creed. The formulation of this creed was made in the intellectual context of Mediterranean theology, that is to say, Greek pagan philosophy. The key difficulties that had to be overcome in the formulation of the Nicene Creed was to allow Jesus, the man, the man that dies, to be part of the Trinity and to be God. The Nicene Creed was written in opposition to the theology of the day. It was purposefully written to refute any theology that said Jesus was not God. The theologians of the day were well educated in Greek philosophy, Justin Martyr probably being the most famous example. For them, Greek philosophy had defined deity as immortality. So Jesus could only be at very best relatively divine because he suffers the conditions of the created world. Jesus calls himself the son of God in one being with the father. There is a claim by Jesus that he is divine. But the witness to Jesus is that he dies. Therefore, Greek philosophy says he cannot be fully divine as he is mortal. Relative divinity is, however, still a useful asset for a theologian and God himself. It means Jesus can bridge the gap between creator and creation. There is an ability for the eternal, immortal and passable God to converse with the temporal creation. Sorry, impassable God to converse with the temporal creation. But by coming into the creation, Jesus can tell us something of God but is immediately dirtied by the human condition, so loses some of his divinity. There are two systematic ways, both of these are heresies, according to Jensen, that facilitate this way of thinking. Firstly, modalism, that the God outside of time appears in history in various roles, the Father or the Spirit or, or the Son. But this denies that the scriptural narrative is about God at all, only a particular emanation of a transcendent God at a certain time. The biblical narrative can then say nothing about the true being of God. God's actual reality can only be thought of through Greek philosophy. Modalism, according to Tertullian, is the theology of the pious, but unthinking. And importantly, it refuses to allow God to be God with us. The second system is subordinationism. The son and spirit are ontologically below God the father. Their divinity is slightly less than the father, who is the full God. The son's relative divinity derives from the logos, the word of God. The logos or the word in the Greek understanding was to recognize the order in nature. And this correlates with the order that comes from God. The logos is God's own reason. The logos is then derived from God and it is implicated in creation. The logos can bridge the gap between God and creation, but because it has an origin, a beginning in God, and is implicated in time, then the Logos is slightly less than perfect divinity. It is only relatively divine. If the Logos becomes enfleshed, becomes man, then we can fully know the reason of God. Jesus is the word of God incarnate, and the Logos is immune to time. The Logos exists as own God reason, and the reason that governs the laws of nature. When Jesus dies, the Logos is saved from the defilements of temporality. The life and death of Jesus are inconsequential, but his teachings are the outworkings of the Logos for those, for those people that heard them. This sounds great. We can know God's word in Jesus Christ, and Jesus can be allowed to die because the Logos does not die. But the reason that subordinationism fails is because Christian theology demands an answer to the question, is the Logos a creature or is it the creator? That is the distinction between God and humanity. This is the gap that needs to be bridged. And here lies the problem with subordinationism. If the Logos is only relatively divine, then it cannot be God. It cannot be creator. It must be creature. The theory of Logos in Christian thinking means, it is own, means that it is only a creature and not divine at all. And this is what was called the Arian heresy.
The Son of God is God's perfect creature. That is what Arius declared. Creatures can suffer. Jesus as the enfleshed Logos can be our saviour, but Jesus is not God. That was the theology that Arius taught, and Jensen argues that this is what many people still believe today. However, there is a major internal contradiction with Arianism. If Jesus is not creator, if Jesus is not God, then worship of Jesus is worship of a creature, not of God. Worship of an undivine Jesus is idolatry. Furthermore, we do not have the true God revealed to us, only his reason. We neither truly know God and God is never truly with us. Arianism relocates God back to the safety of impassibility, leaving humans only the faculty of reason to try and access the true being of God. The resolution to this heresy is found in the Nicene Creed. When we speak of Jesus Christ, we say God from God, true God from true God, of one being with the Father, homoousios, to use the Greek term. All these phrases in the Nicene Creed are to respond and detract from Aeris's claim that Jesus is a creature. The writers of the Nicene Creed wanted to emphasize that Jesus is simply God again. Athanasius, the theologian who gave Christianity the correct understanding of Jesus, determined that Jesus, the Son, and the Father have the same deity, homoousia, but they are distinct by the fact of their relation to one another. The relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit is proper to this deity of God, giving us the common Trinitarian statement of three hypostases in one usia, or to use terms in English, three identities in one being. And that understanding came from the Cappadocians. This is a lot of complicated theology, I realize. So I'll just emphasize the point you need to understand here. The Nicene Creed teaches God is Trinity. And one of the identities of God is Jesus Christ, the son of God. The man who walked around Palestine 2000 years ago. That sounds like the end of the story, problem solved. But sadly, it is not. After the Nicene Creed was affirmed by, at the Council of Constantinople in 381, the man, Jesus, is dogmatically recognized as one of the Trinity. But this is what happens next. It having now been dogmatically decided that the Son is true God, the Antiochenes protect God by distinguishing the suffering Jesus from the Son. The shielding ontological space between God and the passable Jesus is simply prized open at a different place. Here we have the debate between the Alexandrians who said God suffered and the Antiochenes who said God did not suffer. What the Antiochenes wanted to do is modulate the identification of Jesus as God the Son, that when Jesus suffers, God the Son nevertheless does not. And so according to Jensen, a whole new theological discipline was born. Christology. Theology had set itself a new problem to distinguish between the man Jesus and the divine Christ by prying open an ontological space between Jesus the man and the son of God. But this is a problem of its own creating and a problem only if you are committed to the internal and impassive nature of God. As, as it is a problem that creates more difficulties to, to resolve. If you distinguish between the divine Christ and the human man, it is no long, longer logical to say Jesus saves. Jesus is a man and only God can save. Therefore, what role does Jesus the man have in the salvific narrative? Is Jesus simply a vessel for God's action? But then how is Jesus's flesh and blood involved in the salvific narrative? If in the Eucharist we celebrate the physical body and blood of Jesus, then we run the risk of only worshipping a person in our ceremony not God incarnate. Christology is a problem of human creation. We could spend another few hours recalling how this conflict continued. The theological debate continued and produced a now dogmatized idea of the two natures of Christ as enshrined in the Chalcedonian creeds. This concept of two natures meant the Antiochians could be satisfied. The human nature of Christ may be susceptible to the character of time, whilst the nature of Christ the Son remains immune. However, the Chalcedonian definition was an attempt to emphasize that Jesus was one nature. This one nature was from two natures, one divine and one man. But the resulting one nature of Jesus Christ prohibited any distinction between man and God in the life of Christ. 
Jensen points to Cyril, Bishop of Alexandria, who was extremely influential on the Chalcedonian definition because he was aware that the gospel account shows that God is concerned with creation and that God engaged with creation suffers and dies. Any characteristic that applies to the nature of Jesus must apply to the Son too. Jesus is indistinguishably man and God. Any further debate, uh, sorry, after further debate and refinement of the Chalcedonian definition, the Second Council of Nicaea was able to state that one of the Trinity suffered in the flesh. What Jensen is arguing for then is his belief that the orthodox position of the church is that the second identity of God, the Son, is directly the human person that is identified in the gospel. Jesus Christ is the second identity of the Trinity, and Jesus Christ in the gospel dies. This is what we say in the Nicene Creed and the Apostle Creed, that Jesus suffers death. But if this is the orthodox position of the church, that Jesus Christ is the second identity of the Trinity and he dies, why is Jensen having to argue for it again in the 21st century? Well, in a similar vein to what I described last week with Karl Barth, Jensen identifies the reopening of this theological problem with the liberal theology that emerged in the 18th and 19th centuries. Theologians, historians, and modern science increased the skepticism towards a scriptural witness to the life of Jesus Christ. According to liberal theology, Jesus could not be divine. Miracles are impossible, as well as coming back from the dead. Remarkably, this thinking catalyzed a return to natural theology a theology that was formulated on the precepts of that same Greek philosophy, impassibility, immutability, and eternity. 1,500 years after it was dogmatically decided that Jesus Christ was divine, the idea that he was just a perfect human became the theological imperative yet again. In doing so, in doing so Christianity loses its source of revelation as defined by Karl Barth. If Jesus is not God, then we can neither know God, nor can God truly be with us. Robert Jensen wants us to revise our metaphysics. He wants us, in the same way as Karl Barth, to allow God's own revelation to, to define our metaphysics, not Aristotle or Plato. If the God of revelation dies, then he dies. That is what we must base our metaphysics on. And if we do so, we can do theological theology an understanding of God based on God himself. So let us now at least run with the idea of Jesus being fully God, without distinction or separation between the human reality and the divine. What happens if we let the God of the gospel do what he says and let him die? So let us now turn to the Easter Tridium, the three days in which God dies, is buried, and on the third day is resurrected from the dead. Bart and Jensen's theology teach that Easter is the climax of the story of God with us, because Easter defines who the narrative is about. Easter defines the being of God. Remember, God is happening. If God dies, then God is no longer happening. Here, Jensen uses Bart's doctrine of election to give an understanding of the being of God in the Easter narrative that not only speaks about God, but also salvation. The doctrine of election can be summarized as this. The Easter narrative describes a God which elects to be this God. God for himself and God for us. In the Easter story, God elects, God chooses to be this God. And this God is with us and for us. But this is only possible if God dies. So let me explain why this is such an incredibly informative and powerful way of thinking about Easter. The entire biblical narrative of the Old Testament is God's continual offer of salvation, which is continually rejected by the people of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, God promises eternal salvation to those who are faithful to him. But those he reveals himself to eventually turn away to other gods. You only need to get as far as Genesis 3 to read the Jewish understanding of God's promise for infinite existence with him but humanity's intractable desire to pursue their own way, despite God's command. In the New Testament, God himself walked with his people. 
God comes among us in creation and time and offers to those who follow him an eternal kingdom of love and peace. All that has to happen is that offer is accepted. But what does humanity too do? Total, utter rejection. Not just a rejection of God's prophecy or commands, but the being of God himself. The gospel narrative tells a story that when God himself comes to us as Jesus Christ, we kill him. When God walked amongst us, humanity nailed him to a cross and mocked him as he died. This is a rejection of the God who is God for himself, who is also the God who is with us and for us. The rejection of God on Good Friday is total. Therefore, on on Holy Saturday, God has to choose whether he wants to be this God. Why is this? Well, Jensen thinks at this point that anyone who has ever thought about the Trinity must at some point ask, is God a binity on Holy Saturday? Jesus Christ, the Son, is dead. The Trinity exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, being in a perichoretic relationship where each identity is defined by the relationship with the other. But if the Son is dead, then how can the Father be the Father? And how can be the Spirit be the Spirit? God, in some way, on Holy Saturday, is no more. The event of Easter, then, is a dramatic event within the being of God himself. The death of Jesus is a crisis within the being of God. Easter happens to God. The resurrection on Easter Sunday is a positive affirmation of God's eternally free decision to elect to be God with us. Because Jesus is man, he is confined by the finitude of the human experience. He will suffer death. God did not become man to ameliorate death. Death is God's own opponent by God's own choice. And God came as man to suffer death, to be with God with us, and to be God with us unto death. God himself experienced death in Jesus Christ. Therefore, to be the resurrected Jesus Christ is to be the eternal Jesus Christ, as God himself has now overcome death within his own being. The second identity of God is now an eternal identity of God, no longer constrained even by death. The resurrection is the outworkings of the decision to be eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As Jesus, as Jen, I shouldn't call him Jesus, he's called Jensen. As Jensen says, Finally, the Lord's resolve to meet and overcome death and the constitution of his self-identity in dramatic coherence are but one truth about him. For if death and resurrection occurs, this is the infinite dramatic crisis and resolution, and so God's own. Death and resurrection define the being of God to eternally be this God with and for humanity as a second identity of God is human. But the decision that God made to be this God was made after rejection. It was made, it was a decision made in the face of an unjust death of the innocent Christ who was killed for being God. What Karl Barth's doctrine of election also makes room for is the decision to be eternally God, a decision of grace that forgives the rejection by humanity. The doctrine of election seen in the Easter narrative shows a God who in the face of total, utter and complete rejection from the people who he has chosen to be his own, he chooses, he elects to be this God. And by overcoming death, this is an eternal decision of grace. And you may ask, could God have chosen not to resurrect? Jensen says, of course. That could have been a possibility. But doesn't that make the Easter narrative more exciting, more terrifying? A God who could have said no to being the God with us and for us. Doesn't that make the crisis of Easter even more meaningful when it includes God? For the Easter event to be about God, but to do that, we have to let the Easter event be a dramatic crisis within the being of God. We must let him suffer death. God's decision to be this God finds the actualization of that decision in time itself, in the event of Easter. 
the, the decision to be the trying God is the decision to be the resurrected God, the saving God and the God with and for humanity. It is a decision to be God. Here, Jensen teaches that redemption is that God takes the limits of time into himself and makes room in the being of God for creation. God and creation do not collapse into one being, but God defeats the limiting factor of creation, which is death, to allow creation to be part of God's kingdom. The decision is eternal. God's decision to be this God is not constituted at birth, but at death. So in the final few minutes, let us briefly look at the traditional Easter liturgy of the church and how our understanding of the death of God should impact on the way that the church witnesses the life of God in the resolved dramatic crisis of the Easter event. The way the church worships can bring life to the drama, the pain, the suffering, the crisis that happens in God over Easter. Our mission, our vocation, the life of the church is to re-witness the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And by doing so, God is with us in that dramatic event every time. The practices of Easter should reflect the narrative of Easter, the horror and despair in Jesus Christ on Good Friday, the silence, mourning and hopelessness of Holy Saturday, and the joy in underserving grace and forgiveness of Easter Day. Good Friday is the day the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross is commemorated. The liturgy focuses on the passion and death of Jesus Christ. Priests prostrate themselves in front of the cross and the entire congregation falls to its knees in complete and humble submission to the God who died for us. Not a man, but God himself. The veneration of the cross makes the crucifix the centre of devotion. And this has its origins all the way back to the fourth century. An ancient and most solemn and compelling practice of Good Friday was the custom of the burial of Christ in the Easter sepulchre. The pretend body of Jesus Christ and a crucifix were lowered into a sepulchre and the priest would speak the words, I am counted as one of them that go down to the pit. The drama invites people to imagine themselves there on that first Good Friday, a, date, a day of great solemnity, the day that Jesus was buried and people gather around the tomb in mourning because this was the Messiah who had promised the eternal kingdom, but was now dead. On Good Friday, people are compelled not only to reflect on their own mortality, but also the very real mortality of Jesus Christ, a seemingly unimaginable thought that God himself has suffered the human reality of death. This very explicit retelling of the Good Friday narrative through practice not only means the truth of God can be told, but also that the laity can be physically and emotionally involved in the narrative. The practices of this day should encourage us to lament our sins, to experience the desolation of the burial of the injured, innocent Christ. Good Friday is a time of reflection on the sin that humans have brought between themselves and God, culminating in the final rejection of God upon the unjust cross. That we should be forced to, by practice of the church to engage not only with our own death, but also the death of Jesus Christ is an important point to labor. Good Friday, the first day in the Easter Tridium was, and still should be, a time for human introversion, a moment to reflect on an existence without God. Death not only has a say on humanity, but on God too. The narrative of Easter must start with the stark reality that Jesus Christ, one of the triune God, was a man who died. And then Holy Saturday is not an in-between day, which simply waits for the next, but is a void a nothing, shapeless, meaningless, and anticlimactic day, simply the day after the end. These should be anonymous, indefinite hours, filled with memories and assessments of what was finished and past. There should be no reason to imagine that an imminent triumph might render the judgment of our own life premature and incomplete because God is dead. On Holy Saturday, everything is silent. The church is empty. Ponder for a moment why this day is empty and meaningless. Traditionally, the church is empty. It is a day of nothingness because God is silent. As far as the church is concerned, God has been buried and there appears to be little hope. 
The narrative continues, of course, but only after this pause. The lack of activity, however, does not mean this pause can be forgotten. If we allow a time between defeat and victory, between end and beginning, between death and resurrection, then we are left to wait for the unexpected climax of the story. As such, we are forced to consider not only the position of humanity, but also God in the Easter event. On Holy Saturday, the church is dark, just as there was darkness over the land while Jesus Christ lay in the tomb. In contrast, the resurrection brings light. Light should play a central role in the liturgy of Holy Saturday. An Easter fire is lit in the grounds of the church in the evening, and then a paschal candle is lit from this Easter fire and carried into church. Christ is risen and the light has come. The traditions of the Easter vigil are full of meaning that relate to this event of Easter. The priest leads a procession with a newly lit candle back into the church, which is now worth inhabiting again, as God, despite our total rejection, has made the eternal choice to be our God. The Easter vigil begins in the darkness of the tomb with an overwhelming sense of nothingness, emptiness and despair. But the resurrection, the faithful rise into the light as Jesus Christ returns to life. What a wealth there is in the liturgy of the church. The practices of Holy Saturday through to Easter Day follow the narrative of the event itself, from death through hopelessness to the unexpected and undeserved glory of the resurrection. What I had tried to reconstruct for you over the last 40 minutes or so is why Jensen thinks it's so important yet so difficult to accept that God dies. For Jensen, we have to overcome our conceptual dissonance that God might indeed die but to do so allows the revelation of God to be restricted only by God himself. As soon as we start imposing our own philosophical burdens on the revelation of Jesus Christ, we greatly restrict what God can reveal to us. To allow God to die allows God to participate in his own story, a story that is told with and for humanity. God is caught up in the dramatic events of history, contingent upon the people he chooses as his own. If death occurs in God, then Easter is a dramatic event within the life of God himself. And the resolution of this crisis has consequences for God and humanity. By letting God tell his story, we can begin to understand how this story is a story of God who wishes to redeem his creation for himself. The church, church's liturgy requires, even more it demands, that the event of Easter is a crisis in the being of God. If we dismiss the death of God as being inconsequential to the being of God, then this drama is only an event for, a human, for humanity, an event that only has meaning in the human experience, while God continues unperturbed in a transcendent, unknowable realm. By accepting the death of God, we are accepting that God chooses to be with us and for us unto death. And this should be the guiding principle for the church who confesses that Jesus Christ is the Lord our God. And finally, why do I think that this is the most important teaching that church has to offer in my context? Well, next week, if you're so kind to join me again, I would like you to tell the problem with theology that I think I have identified. How science is limited by the finitude of existence, both human death and the finite nature of the material universe. And due to these epistemological limitations, Science is defining what can and cannot exist. By dismissing a God who can take the limitations of existence into his own being, a God who can make room for death within himself, and a God who can open up the horizons of time beyond the limitations of finitude, Christianity is bereft of its most powerful response to atheism that is defined by the scientific method. As promised, I leave you with this, and I challenge you this coming Easter. So thank you very much for listening, and as always, questions are most welcome. Good evening, and thank you very much, Dr. Sam. Um, we open the floor at this point in time for questions. Um, please simply 
um, do the hand raise thing and we will, we will spawn or you can place a question in the Q&A. Open the floor to questions. Go ahead, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Um, Dr. Sam, thank you for your very engaging presentation on um, Professor Jensen. Um, I'm glad that you noted that two of his books were in the Cardinal College Library. Um, have you found his smaller book that was published soon after he passed on uh, Theology and Outline. Yeah. Is, is yeah. that also in the library? Um, I, I'm not sure, actually. Well, I, I, um, I, would, I would strongly urge as a, between yourself and Dr. Sang and um, Michael and uh, Principal Clark, that copies of that one, you know, a theology and outline, could be made available to all of the theological students, the, those who are studying for ordination um, at the college at the moment, because uh, they would find it as a very useful tool to follow up on some of the issues that you have um, outlined in your, in your presentation. Um, I was struck by the fact that you regarded him as one of the greatest theologians um, of, the, of the 20th century in the United States. And I'm sure that um, other theologians uh, from the United States would take issue, issue with that. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, he has been a very, very good exponent of Karl Barth and lots of what he said resonated well with the people at Princeton Theological Seminary. So we give God thanks for um, Dr. Jensen and what he's left uh, behind. I myself use him uh, quite a lot in my courses here at Howard University. But on the question of um, the crucifixion, we have to remember that the church as a whole has one central uh, way of affirming the faith. It comes, as you know, at the very heart of the Eucharistic prayer. When we say, um, let us proclaim the mystery of our faith, the mystery of our faith. And that mystery we proclaim in words, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And it goes back, I think, to the very deep problem of how the early Christians, before any gospel was actually written, and even before Paul himself wrote either Romans or Corinthian correspondence, to what were we to do with the death of Christ? And because they were engaged in 
um, proclaiming a most preposterous um, affirmation that God had raised Jesus from the dead. They had to wrestle with some of the ways in which um, this claim could make sense. Bearing in mind the fact that the resurrection theme was not a Christian invention. Um, people had spoken of resurrection many times before. The only, difficult, only difficulty was, was it going to be a general resurrection or a personal and individual resurrection? The Christians took the line that it was an individual and personal resurrection. And so it came really in contrast with the, the general theme, especially in uh, Jewish theology about a general resurrection. So here comes the problem. Here comes the problem. Jensen and Bath and you yourself have been dealing with not only the timelessness of God, but also the timelessness of the mystery of God. And just as we are prepared to say that there were no witnesses to the resurrection, how can we proclaim something that um, we have no evidence for? Last Sunday, you remember that, um, and I, I saw you in church at the, at the uh, St. Michael's Cathedral, so I know that you attended Mass. And there, um, the second reading, of course, was from 1 Corinthians 15, uh, chapter 15, uh, where uh, St. Paul uh, declared what had become for him what we are calling the, the USP, the unique selling point of Christianity, that Christ was raised uh, from the dead. The big question for me, for you, for us, is how, when, and why? Now, if, if God raises Jesus from the dead, lay aside the, the question of the death of God, because clearly the, the word death there has to be put in quotation marks. If God raises Jesus from the dead, when does that take place? Most modern theologians recognize that to speak of God raising Jesus from the dead means that the, res the resurrection takes place in the very heart of the crucifixion so that the tridium of which we speak and our liturg liturgical theology makes clear, the tridium is really dealing not so much with when uh, the resurrection takes place, but how we understand the discovery of the empty tomb in the story. So that Easter day is primarily the celebration of the discovery of the empty tomb. And this creates all kinds of problems for theology. It creates all kinds of problems for chronology. And it certainly places us in a position where we have to create that link between the earliest affirmation of the Christian tradition and the earliest written tradition of the Christian commission as we have both in the letters of Paul and also in the gospels. So the challenge continues that resurrection is mystery. Death of God is a, a, a theologically metaphorical way of speaking about divine possibility. But above all, the death of God creates for us this understanding of sacrifice, which I'm afraid that Jensen didn't mention much and you didn't mention much of it either. And that's where I think that the debate has to continue. I'm sorry to have taken so long, but pardon an old man who um, listened attentively and wanted to make a contribution since I saw no other hands going up. No, well, thank you very much. Um... And it, is, and it is what I enjoy about Jensen theology a lot. It challenges us. Um, you can't say that it's not a challenge to what we think and believe about God. Um, one of the big challenges is with Jensen's theology is if God is dead, the being of God ceased to exist uh, in the death of Jesus, then who is left to resurrect Jesus? Um, the recourse to mystery is obviously something that Christianity has done a lot. Um, 
but systematic theology is rather uh, reticent to go to, uh, to mystery to play that as its trump card. Um, but I think in this case, uh, mystery is probably the only thing we have left to offer. Uh, and, and Robert Jensen does acknowledge that himself in his systematic theology. He says there are just some questions that we cannot answer because there is no revelation to go on. There is nothing revealed. There is nothing revealed between the death and the empty tomb. Um, so it, it, is, it is a mystery. Don't forget to get those books for the, for the students of Codrington. I'm sure Codrington can make a donation of copies for each person. Any further questions for Dr. Any questions from the gentleman in the room? Uh, Sam, Samuel Biggin. Um, there was a hand raised, but it's been lowered. Any additional questions for Dr. Dirty? Or he'd be so concise and clear that we have no questions. <laughs> yes, I have raised my hand, yes. Hello? And we can hear you. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> in my own simple, limited um, education in theology, um, I think the question goes back to Genesis, the creation. Um, when God created the earth, he rested on the seventh day. Um, when Jesus was crucified on Friday, he was laid to rest on the seventh day and was raised on the first day of the week. Jesus did say that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. Um, so I think it's must, in my limited view, it has a link to creation, where God rested on the seventh day, and Jesus was laid to rest on the seventh day. Now, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm an Anglican from the, <laughs> I was born an Anglican, raised an Anglican, and I will die an Anglican, but this is what I see coming through. Yes, I agree there is mystery there, but this is the way I think it was ordained to be, that he had to rest on the seventh day and was raised on the first day of the week. And the first day of the week coincides with the first day of creation. That is my simple little observation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting you, you raised the point because Jensen says that actually the resurrected Christ is the beginning of time, uh, that that's actually the first day of creation. So it, it is a, it's a, a purely valid, a very valid theological point. Um, I didn't talk about it today because it's uh, masterfully complicated, but Jensen does some interesting things with the concept of time and actually places the beginning of time on Easter uh, and all of creation then then spirals around that single point of God's own self identification. So there is definitely a link between between resurrection and creation. <laughs>
Any additional questions? Any final words, Dr. Sam? Dr. Dirty, any, any final words? No, thank you very much for your attention and, um, and the questions and, and comments that were made. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. And if you just bow our heads and we will say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Please join us again next week, same time, same link, and we look forward to the third and final presentation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. Thank you, Lord Sam.